professor Shashank, principal of Midas. Welcome to Architecture and Midas. Architecture is a creative field that combines imagination and practical knowledge. Architecture is also a field that deals with designing of shelters, one of the three basic necessities of human beings apart from food and clothing. For any architectural education institute, three things are essential. First one is the infrastructure, second one is the mentors and the faculty and the third one is the environment in which this teaching learning process takes place. Prior to coming here as the Dean of Midas, I had been to many other places in the capacity of teaching as well as in the capacity of uh, professional practice. I am a person who truly believe in nurturing the education Buddha. So my message to the students and parents and the faculty of Midas is that everybody is bestowed and gifted with their own unique talents. Somebody has to nurture it. Somebody has to help you identify your strengths and then work on it to become successful and grateful. So Medas is a place where you can come, get identified. You can find out who you are, what you are. And this is the place which is bestowed with such faculties and the facilities which helps and nurtures the students to come, find out, identify and conquer the world. say that those who wish to explore their interest throughout the entire session please do not disturb the speaker at any moment if you have any issues you can always contact the admin via the chat or through the messages so with that set of instructions i think i now hand over the session to our principal professor shashank chatridya sir Thank you, Praveen. Good morning, uh, Dr. Edward Segal from New York. And good evening to all the students and participants from India. Thanks for joining this virtual session today. And my special thanks to Dr. Segal for accepting uh, the invitation to deliver this lecture to our students. Before he begins his session, I would like to tell a short introduction of Dr. Segal so that you will know him better and what he has been doing. Dr. Segal is an assistant professor in the Department of Engineering at Australia University. He received his BS from Cornell University and his MSc and PhD from Princeton University. In 2008, he was awarded a Skidmore Orange and Merrill that is SOM Structural Engineering Travel Fellowship to study European physical modeling and testing laboratories and the structures that emerge from those facilities. The objective of this research was to identify potential roles for physical models as complements to computational models in design and education. In 2017, he received the EXCEED, that is Excellence in Civil Engineering Education, teaching award from American Society of Civil Engineers. In 2019, he was selected to be an AC Exit Fellow. From 2008 to 2011, he worked at Simpson, Gumperts and Giger, and he is a licensed professional engineer in New York. Now, I welcome our esteemed speaker, Dr. Edward Segal, to this virtual session and request him to begin his presentation. Thank you very much.
Thanks so much for the introduction. And thank you to the principal, Praveen, and the other organizers for inviting me to be a part of the, your webinar series. Over the weekend, I had a chance to watch portions of some of the previous webinars that have been posted online. And I saw that last Friday, actually, my PhD advisor, Sigurd Adriansen, gave a presentation to your, uh, your university. So some of the work that I'm going to show today I actually completed with Sigurd as part of my PhD. Many of the bridges and buildings that surround us are built from a limited set of materials, such as concrete, steel, glass, and wood. And these materials all have well-established precedents, standards, and design guidelines. The clay brick is perhaps another conventional material and perhaps the one whose behavior is the easiest to imagine. You know, many of us, when we're, we're children, we begin to get a sense of how bricks work by stacking together Legos or blocks or other other toys. Here's actually a photograph of my older daughter the first time she put two blocks together. And here's the building that I work in. So it's a, um, a typical application of brick in a building exterior. For this building, the brick is just facade and not actually structure helping to support the building. Right? The bricks are on the outside just supporting their own weight through compression. Compression is, push, is a pushing force while its opposite tension is a, is a pulling force. Bricks are good in compression in situations like this and bad in tension. But we can use bricks in much more interesting and structural ways. And here's a vaulted ceiling in the Grand Central Terminal in New York City designed by Raphael Guastavino. Here, the brick is now load bearing. So through shaping, we now have this curved structure. We're actually able to carry load with a very thin layer of material. So the brick doesn't just support itself, but it also supports what's above it. And we can find examples of these kinds of structures all around the world. Here's another example. This is a church in Uruguay designed by Eladio Dieste. And here you can see that not just the uh, ceiling, but also the walls are curved as well. Here's a library in India that was designed by the architecture firm SP plus A. And here you're even better able to see how thin these structures can be if shaped properly. So if you look at the edge of the roof where it overhangs the glass, you can see the free edge of the, the masonry and it's only three uh, brick thicknesses deep. Now, while bricks are a well-established set of materials, there are a number of researchers that are always looking for alternatives. And here are some of the products being developed that have catchy headlines. Of course, there's, there's other ones, but these ones were, um, interesting when I, when I saw them come across. So cigarette butts make for better, cleaner bricks. And the idea here is that you can trap the heavy metals that are present in cigarette butts so that they can't get into waterways. So the idea is that you're not only making a new material, but you're also doing something that's environmentally friendly. The designers here are claiming that the bricks are less expensive and require less energy to produce in standard bricks. I'd, I'd have to dig into that a little bit deeper, but people are definitely doing research to try to come up with new products for these different building markets. Here's a, a second headline that I saw. It's how to grow bricks from trillions of bacteria. And so here the bacteria ultimately help sand particles stick together. So it's looking for different ways to bind particles within these kinds of elements. Plastic waste is one of the major environmental challenges that we all face. And others are tackling this challenge by making blocks from plastic waste. And so here you see a block by the group called Bifusion, where they take different plastics, they shred them down, and they heat them and compress them into these different uh, block forms. On the other end of the spectrum, others are looking at natural bricks. And here are bricks that are grown from the root structure of mushroom materials. This is what are, these are what are called mycelium blocks. And this product ends up having similar mechanical properties to foam. These have been used for non-structural applications that range from lamp fixtures to dresses to inserts when you order something online, maybe a, a new computer. These kind of protect the components. But it's not just a material that's used at these small scales. It's actually been used as a structural building material. And here what you're looking at is a temporary tower that was built by the architecture firm The Living with the help of engineers at Arup. This is at uh, MoMA PS1. It's a center for art in New York City. This was built a few years ago. It's a set of kind of three chimney structures that merge together. And despite the material's low strength, if those blocks are used in the right configuration, they can still be utilized. So this structure ends up being about 15 meters tall. So now we've seen that even the most basic of structural components, the brick, is being updated in unconventional ways. Waste is being integrated into bricks and we're even growing our own natural bricks. 
So in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to discuss a series of experimental projects that I've worked on that utilize other kinds of unconventional building materials. So first, I'll talk about rope bridges, and then I'll talk about two pavilions. The first one I'll talk about is the two blue shells pavilion. And then finally, I'll end the presentation by discussing the cast in place pavilion shown at the top right. As I previously mentioned, tension is the inverse of compression. Ropes that are pulled taut or that are hanging like the chain shown in this photo carry only tension. And these are really efficient structures. They allow us to build really long spanning structures. In fact, the longest spanning structures in the world are all primarily tension structures. It's because they utilize the material that they have very efficiently. Now, the chains that are shown here are left over from a 15th century Tibetan suspended footbridge. Across the world, also in the 15th century, the Incas were developing natural fiber rope bridges. Natural fiber, in contrast to iron chain, is not as durable. The fibers break down. And the bridge that you see here in this photo is rebuilt every year still. And this really becomes a community exercise to build the bridge. So, you know, in different cultures, we have similar forms, these suspended bridges, but the way that they're articulated in the actual structures and the materials that they use, the way that they build them, the way that they care for them are different. Here's a set of living root bridges in India, and now the materials are the roots of the rubber fig trees that have been manipulated to grow in a particular way. So again, a different culture and a different articulation of the same kind of principles. Modern versions of these bridges are typically made from steel cable, and often the steel cable structures now are, are even longer spans. The one that you see here was built by the non-government organization Bridges to Prosperity. Groups like Bridges to Prosperity and Helvetas uh, build these kinds of structures all over the world, often teaming with people that are in the communities, as well as engineers, architects, and builders from around the world. These kinds of bridges are often built in rural parts of the world, and in these parts of the world, there's still over 1 billion people that lack consistent access to roadways and are disconnected from resources like schools, clinics, and markets. So often there's an obstacle, like a ravine, and you have a network of roads on one side and a network of roads on the other side, but between the two, you're missing these connections. And if we can build suspended footbridges between them or other bridges between them, we can strengthen the network as a whole. So while we're building primarily with steel cable today, why can't these long spanning modern footbridges be built with alternative materials? What other rope materials offer advantages over steel cables? And so this was the premise of a project that I worked on with uh, Professor Adrian since of, of Princeton University starting back in 2011. And we decided to focus on polyester rope. So polyester rope is a synthetic material. It's low cost, it's low weight, and it has good durability. And so all these features made it a good candidate for our particular application. The material is frequently used in offshore mooring and other boating applications, so it's widely available. And here what you see is a 64 meter span polyester rope bridge that was built in Morocco by the non-government organization Engineers Without Borders with the United States Peace Corps and the local community. It was built in 2013 as a demonstration project, right? Again, to demonstrate the, the idea that these structures could be built from material other than steel cable. The lead designer for this project was Ryan Woodward, who at the time was an engineer at HNTB. And I was involved at the time in this specific bridge doing the inspection and then also performing additional analyses so that we could have a better understanding of how polyester rope bridges behave. Here's an on the deck view of the, the bridge. So you can see that the structure is wide enough for one, maybe two people to walk side by side at a time. And here's the bridge shown in elevation or from the side. And we get a sense for how slender this, this structure is. And in fact, these polyester rope bridges, and I'll show this in the, the next slide in another elevation, are much flatter than their steel cable counterparts to begin with. And that's because the polyester rope is much more flexible. It's much stretchier than the steel cable. So we initially will pre-stress this rope or pre-tension the, the rope, which gives it this flatter look to begin with. Now, if you look at the right side of the image of the drawing of the bottom, you see 11%. And so that 11% represents the maximum walking slope that someone has to 
go up to get across the end of the, the structure. So when we initially pre-stress this bridge, this is what you'd have to have to deal with. But if we apply the full pedestrian load that's required by the code, and this is quite large, this is a row area, so this is going to be a live load that the bridge will never really see. We find the structure deflects a lot. Again, the material is very flexible. The tension form itself is very flexible. And at this point, you see that that slope that was 11% is now up to 42.8%. So it's very large. And so at this point, this is going to be difficult to traverse. Typically, we try to limit these walking slopes to something like 20 to 25%. And so this becomes really interesting because you can imagine that at some point, if you saw the slope was going to be too onerous to try to walk up, very steep, you wouldn't even step on the bridge. You would wait for people to finish crossing the structure and then you would go on it. Or maybe you're very adventurous and you decide, okay, I'm going to try to get up that, that high incline. And so in a way, the bridge can become self-limiting. People will wait their turn to go across the structure. Right. The alternative to that is that we can put signs at the structure that determine what kinds of loads and how many people can be on the structure at a time. But if you decide that you want to ride your horse across the bridge, well, you just change the sign and you go across. Now, if you've never had the chance to go across a bridge like this, I recommend you try to find one locally that you, you can because they're um, they move. They're definitely more flexible and you can you really have an interesting experience walking across the structure. But I will also share this video with you so you can see what it's like to cross this specific bridge. So here we go. And this was a video that we took with about 12 or 13 of us walking across the structure. On the deck, you see these little boxes. We had actually put sensors on the structure to capture the acceleration of it. You see it does move a lot. We have these high handrails, so we're safe. Here's a laptop that we strapped to the, the deck to also capture data. Okay. So while there's some opportunity to utilize polyester rope for long spinning bridges in rural areas, like the one that I just showed, I've also been looking at how these bridges can be rapidly deployed for disaster relief. So this is a photo from a town just across the river from New York City after a major hurricane in 2012. And so that you, you see that there's water filling the, filling the streets. One of the big challenges is that these lightweight rope bridges require heavy anchorages. So when you have a bridge, if you were to use a, a beam bridge or a truss bridge, they tend to be heavier structures through the main span because they have to take a combination of bending and, and other loads, but their end anchorages can be rather simple. Now, in contrast, we can get to much lighter weight structures. So a, a cable or rope bridge compared to a truss or beam bridge is going to be much lighter in weight through the main superstructure. But we end up having to then include large anchorages at the ends. And so you see in the photo at the left, this is the anchorage for the bridge in Morocco. The orange ropes were the main bridge ropes. They come back into these blue ropes that allowed us to help tension the bridge and provide adjustability. Those blue ropes are then wrapped around steel rebar that goes down into concrete. That concrete is then tied back into the rock of the ravine with rock anchors. But this is a really heavy, significant anchorage. What we're trying to do is utilize these rope bridges for rapidly deployable scenarios, and we need to replace that heavy anchorage with a different kind of heavy anchorage. And so what you see on the right is a demonstration bridge that we built on campus that uses vehicles as the end anchorage. And the other nice thing about this is that that vehicle can actually be the object that delivers the bridge to the site as well. In addition to looking at vehicles and water tanks and other objects like that that we can either bring to the site or um, drop off at, or find at the site, we're looking at trees as end anchorages, natural features. And so here you can see two trees at a site that we've been uh, making practice deployments at. With support from the Thornton Thomas Study Foundation, we've developed a design for a 10 meter bridge that utilizes the components that are shown here. All these components fit into two large backpacks that can be carried by two people to sites that aren't accessible by vehicles. So everything is, is relatively lightweight. Now, when we're doing this deployment, we rely on a combination of manual drone flight one of the people doing the deployment will actually fly the drone 
and prefabrication of the bridge components. And this combination of using the drone and prefabricating the components is going to allow us to rapidly deploy the bridge in cases not where we have access to both sides of the bridge, but actually in cases where we only have access to one side. You can imagine that you show up at a site and you're on one side of an obstacle and then there's a river or a place where there's been a flood and you wanna connect across that and you can't access that second side. And so we've developed a technique where we can access the second side and deploy a bridge from the first one. And the components that you see in this photo, to give you a sense of what you'll see in the, the dish, the photos that are to come, in the top left over here, we have these come-alongs. These are used to help tension the structure. They provide great mechanical advantage. Directly below them, these blue ropes are the main ropes for the bridge structure, the primary structure for the bridge. In the center, we have a DJI Phantom drone. This is an off-the-shelf, commercially available drone that we're going to fly. Directly below it, we have a roller that we custom 3D printed that will let out a spool with this very small diameter polyester rope. This polyester rope here serves as what's called the pilot line. It's gonna be the first line that we pass across the obstacle. We have a ratchet strap below this. And so a ratchet strap like the come alongs in the top left can help tension and detension the structure. We have a set of carabiners down here like you might use to rock climb with. To the right here, these ropes are actually slings or loops, and they are adjustable. They provide adjustability for us in the, at the site. Top right is one of the backpacks, and the bottom right is a net. And so the net is gonna serve as both the guardrails that protect people walking across the structure, but it also ser serves as the deck directly. It's what people will be walking on. And so we decided to go with all flexible, lightweight components, and that's going to really bring down the weight of the structure. Here is a close-up of the drone that we used with the custom 3D printed spool below. Again, on that spool is a pilot line that we're going to pull initially. On the controller, you can see that there's a smartphone that's been inserted in. So what's gonna happen is we'll, we'll have certain commands that we can do like automatic takeoff and automatic landing. Additionally, the drone has a front-facing camera and that front-facing camera will give us a video feed on the phone. So the pilot of the drone will be able to see the drone directly, so one point of view, and then get a second view on his camera that gets put to his phone. Here is the site that we worked with, and the drone is on the, the ground here. We're assuming in this case that we only have access to one side. So again, the, the side where my two students, Nick Balitsis and Lori Alkowitz are located, that is the, the near side, the one we're going to assume we have access to. And then we'll have to use our imagination to pretend that there's a river that, that's flowing between these two trees. And then this tree at the right is going to be the far side anchorage. Here we can see that the drone is taken off. Nick is the one flying the drone. And coming down below the drone, you can see this white line. Again, that pilot line is starting to be, be let out. The drone is now moving forward and you can see the pilot line is being let out. And now Lori has stepped into our imaginary river. She is actually not helping with the deployment at this point. She is just taking video and photographs from other angles to capture what we are working on. Now the drone is going around one of the tree branches. So at the far side, we have this Y-shaped branch configuration that allows us to deploy this structure. And the drone now is returning back to the initial site initial side rather. Now Nick is has disconnected the pilot line and the pilot line is being pulled on. So he's pulling on that thin diameter white line. And you can see that he's dragging across two other blue ropes. Here's a, another view. So as he's pulling, the blue ropes are getting dragged around that far side tree. And it's key that he's pulling two ropes into place because what's gonna happen is when those blue ropes get back to him, now, they're going to attach the ropes to the, the net. Lori's gonna take over one of the ropes. Nick's gonna take over the other and they're gonna pull in opposite directions. And now in doing so, they're able to pull across a net that's gonna span across the opening. And so they're gonna do that by hand for a while. And now they're getting ready to further tension the, the bridge using those come alongs that are gonna provide mechanical advantage. So you'll see right now that the bridge is quite slack. And then as they use those come alongs to tension the structure, here they're, they're moving along. You can see that the bridge has kind of lifted up off the ground and now the bridge is completely installed. 
So if we look at the bridge from the near side, that Anchorage side that we had access to originally, you can see the, the bridge. And down low here, you can see those come-alongs that were used to help tension the, tension the structure. We deployed this structure at two different sites to test out the different components and to look at different configurations. And here is the bridge at the second site. Now we have Nick walking across the structure. He's able to go across the 10 meter bridge in just under a minute. The net again is serving both as guardrail and as walking surface. And the key thing with the net is that you're choosing a mesh size such that it's relatively easy to walk on. You don't want your feet to get caught in in the openings, but you also don't want to use so much net that it's going to be too too heavy and too difficult to pull across the opening. So Nick here is demonstrating that all the components are structurally sufficient. So we've been continuing to work on this project. We're looking at how we can further adapt it, go to longer spans, accommodate variations in spans, accommodate different end anchorages. And so this is a, a really interesting project that just uh, just keeps going. Now those suspended bridges that I that I showed all depend on the hanging ropes or hanging cables being in tension. And in the foreground of this photograph, we can see that there's a vine right here. And that vine is also hanging in tension. And this particular hanging form is called a catenary. And it's the natural shape that a rope or a vine will take on under its own weight. And if we can freeze that form, so that tension only form that we see here and flip it over, we're able to return to forms like those shells that we saw at the beginning of the presentation, those curved roof structures that are actually in pure compression. And so if we look in the background of this photo, we see a whole series of catenary arches all made out of bricks. Now, again, many of the forms that I showed early in this presentation use this same kind of principle, but they weren't these two-dimensional structures. They were those three-dimensional roof structures instead. The specific structure that you're looking at here is in Barcelona and was designed by Antonio Gaudí. Gaudí, who is well known for his architecture, is also very much acted as an engineer. And I think what you'll find is that if you look at both his work as an architect and his work as an engineer, they're both beautiful but in different ways. He's really working in different, different capacities. And so this structure, if you were to look at the outside of it, it looks like a typical Gaudi facade. It's very whimsical. There's lots of curved surfaces. But on the inside here, there's a different kind of visual expression. We have these curves, but they're based on the structural efficiency of a catenary. And if you look across many of Gaudi's engineered works, you're going to find that he often uses these structurally efficient catenaries. Now, going back to the shell structures that we looked at the beginning of the presentation, on the right is a set of models that were developed by the Swiss engineer Heinz Eisler, who really pioneered this technique of hanging membranes in pure tension and then flipping them over so that they were in pure compression. And he would work on small scale physical models like the ones on the right. And then he would take very careful measurements and use that to develop the geometry for the shells at the the left. And so the shells that left are for a set of uh, tennis courts. This is a really powerful technique. And I have my senior design students explore this technique. And here what you can see is a number of these forms that are hanging. And there's lots of variation. I gave all the students the same size piece of fabric. I told them all to hang the fabric at four corners. And yet every single structure that they developed is slightly, slightly different. And so this technique develops lots of variation in form, even from a small number of parameters. Again, this technique is really used to develop small scale models. You can imagine something at your desk or table that then is, is informing the geometry of the full scale structure, right? Heinz Eisler made these small scale models and then used those to scale up to his large scale structures. The technique is not really used to build full scale structures, right? We're not hanging a full scale structure in tension and then flipping it. But what if we could do it? What if we could actually build these at full scale? And so that was the premise back in 2011 when two architects approached a colleague and me while I was still working in practice. They wanted to design a pavilion for what's um, a site in New York City called Governor's Island. And their idea is shown in these renderings here. They wanted to create the shell structure out of a composite jute material 
and they wanted to construct the shell by performing a full-scale flip. They wanted to hang the entire structure, they wanted to cut it into quarters, and then they wanted to flip it over. However, if you look at the models here, the renderings, you can see that there's a band on top of the rendering at the left, and the surface is actually flat. And so when they were doing the form finding process, they were hanging their membrane, but it wasn't taking on a pure tension form because they would have the form be interrupted by the ground. And so by introducing this other boundary, they're disturbing the natural form that would be generated. And they did this for a very practical reason. They wanted the band up top, they wanted this flat surface. But the problem now is that they don't have a structure that's in pure tension when it's hanging and pure compression when it's flipped. Instead, the structure now is going to have some bending. And so when you have very uh, thin sections that are subject to bending, especially with point loads due to people on top, you're gonna run into issues. Additionally, at least at the time, this jute fiber composite wasn't well established and we had our, we had our concerns. So we, we worked with the architects and we asked them to uh, form find the structure again. And so they did this through a combination of physical and computer models. Here you can see some of the models that they did in their kitchen. They have the hanging membrane and then flipped in compression to get rid of that flat portion. And so now if we look at the rendering at the left, which is the original one, to the rendering at the right, which is the revised geometry, we see that the revised geometry has more curvature. So now it's in pure compression and the band has been removed from that and they can play their, their concerts below. Now we didn't win that competition back in 2011, but ever since then I've been thinking about how we can possibly use this flipping technique at this large scale to see if it's, if it's possible. So in 2018, so seven years later, finally had a chance to try something like this again. The International Association for Shell and Spatial Structures had a call for a competition to build a pavilion in Barcelona for their 2019 symposium. And for those of you that are interested, there'll be an, another competition and symposium in 2021 by the same organization, and that one will be held in the UK. Now, the team that I worked with was interested in exploring how we could reuse waste, and we were focused on reusing plastics. Eventually, we settled on acrylic, but for a time, we were studying other, other plastics like polyester that you can find in, in water bottles. The competition also had a requirement that the parts for the pavilion fit into six boxes. This was to help allow for transport to the site. There were teams coming from all over the world, and they also had a limited site on at the symposium for us to build, so they had to provide some kind of size constraint. Now, this size constraint really required that we develop a discretized design. We could no longer build a monolithic shell, a shell that's all one continuous surface. So instead, we had to come up with a design that broke it up into smaller pieces that we could pack. And so here you can see the concept. At the left, we are pinning our acrylic, and you can see that the the strings that are picking up the corners of the acrylic are different lengths, and that's going to be key because that's going to allow the shape to take on an asymmetric form. We're going to hang the structure, and then after we hang the structure, we can disassemble, ship it, and when we're back in Spain, we can either assemble this in the hanging position or we can flip the structure over, and that's what we intended to do. We intended to create this shell-like structure at the, the right. Now, this, these are all renderings, and the, the problem with acrylic, and it's not really a problem, but just kind of the feature of acrylic, is that it doesn't behave like Heinz Easter models or the models that my students make, where we would either pour some kind of liquid that would cure on the membrane, or we'd use plaster of Paris. Here, when you hang the acrylic, it's not just gonna take the shape that you show here. There's gonna be some deflection. You're gonna have the self-weight of the structure deform it, but that's elastic deformation. It's completely recoverable. The structure, when you would take it from hanging and put it back on the ground, all that deformation would go away. So what you need to do is you actually need to transform the material and you do that through heating it. So when you heat the acrylic, it eventually passes a point called the glass transition temperature. And so you're heating the acrylic up slowly and you take it to the point where it hasn't melted, it just becomes very stretchy. 
And when it becomes very stretchy, essentially it's Young's modulus or stiffness has become very low. And in this form, it at this time, it's going to deflect and form a, a curved shape. And now when you cool the acrylic, you're going to be able to lock this shape in and the stiffness is going to return back to its original. And so this deformation is not recoverable. It's not going to bounce back into a flat shape. So we tested this idea out and we did this at the home oven scale. So a very small, small scale. And the nice thing about polyester is that it's not toxic at the temperatures that we're heating at. So you, you could actually do this in, a, in an oven at home. We submitted renderings like the one that you see here. Others have experimented with this similar heat-based form finding, but they've been doing this at the, the small scale for, again, small models that would inform large-scale structures. But here we wanted to combine the design and the construction together and try this out at the large scale. So we were really fortunate. Our pavilion was one of the ones selected for inclusion in the symposium. There were about, uh, I think, 20 that were ended up being selected and, and built. And so we got to work. So here we are at a company called PlexiCraft. It's a furniture manufacturer. They make acrylic furniture in New York City. And we're going through the scrap at their facility. So at the left, I'm going through barrels, trying to find pieces that we could use for tiles. At the right, my colleague, Albert Chow, who's an architect, is doing the same. PlexiCraft also had these sheets of hot pink acrylic that had been left over from a previous project that uh, they didn't think they could use anymore. They had sat so long that this brown adhesive was difficult to get off, and the company at this point really considered this to be waste. They didn't plan to keep it or to use it for other cases. So while we'd initially planned to use blue acrylic, which had led us to use the name Two Blue Shells, we ultimately used hot pink acrylic. So this is a good lesson in the way that you name, name projects. If you can't guarantee you're going to have a, a certain color, um, Best maybe not to name it that way. Here we are in Brooklyn doing a mock-up. So in the top left, you can see the frame that we're going to eventually put into a large scale oven and hang our shelf from. At the right, you can see the acrylic in smaller tiles. So we took those large sheets that we had donated and we used a laser cutter to cut them down into smaller pieces. We then would connect adjacent pieces together through smaller tiles. We wanted to make sure that the connectors themselves were the same material as the primary tiles so that the whole structure would behave the same way when heated. In the bottom left, you can see the full seven by seven grid flat on the ground. And now in the bottom right, what you see is the acrylic being lifted up off the ground. And so this is the acrylic not heated, but just how it deforms under its own self weight. And again, this deformation is completely elastic or recoverable. When we took this down off the frame, it returned back to its flat shape. Now, to pull this whole thing off, we needed to find a large scale oven. So I ended up contacting over 20 different companies in the search. Finally, we found a company whose owner was not only open to experimenting, but generously let us use his facility the first time for free. So we didn't have a, a very large budget for this project at all. So that was key. And here's the oven. It is a pretty terrifying thing. It's nine meters long. It's 2.5 meters wide and three meters tall. That's a walk-in oven. And what I'm going to show you now is a time-lapse video of the process. So here it goes. So you can see the frame being lifted into the oven. And we have a number of people there that day helping. Now the acrylic is being laid out on the, the ground and being lifted into place. And we're making a couple, couple adjustments in the oven. Again, any deformation that you see now is just from its own self-weight and is completely recoverable. Close the oven. We're heating the oven up to the point where we're going to pass the glass transition temperature. The acrylic is going to become stretchy, and then we're going to allow it to, to cool in the oven before we open the doors. So this whole process took about 20, 25 minutes, and here we go. So now if you look at the structure, you can see that the, the change in form is quite dramatic. We're taking measurements because we want to compare it back to some digital models that we've made. And we also want to make sure we have the right coordinates when we locate the supporting posts. Now we took the acrylic out and we're going to take the frame out of the oven as well. So the whole process would take about five or six hours. The setup outside, we would then come into the oven 
and then do the cleanup. And so in the oven itself, it was probably there for about an hour to an hour and a half, heating only for 20 minutes, but then all the prep and all the cleanup took a couple hours. What you can see in this photo is the before and after. So at the left, you can see the shell when it's hanging under just its own self weight before heating. And then after at the right, we can see it heating. And so the figure at the right shows a form that is in pure tension, very efficient structure. The, the thickness of the acrylic here is about three millimeters. Here's another view of the shell hanging in the oven. And so even though I call this hot pink acrylic, as you walk around it, you can see that there's kind of different colors that you find based on the way the light is hitting it. So there's kind of pink, orange, and yellow. And then as we go into the oven and look back outside, you can see the, the pink color here as well. Here the shell is being removed with many hands. So I had a number of students with us that day that were luckily able to help us. So because we're taking this out of its pure hanging form, we need to have lots of hands to make sure that we don't introduce loads on this that are going to cause any, any issues. Now we're disassembling the shell. So we have to take apart all the different tiles, pack them up and transport them all for construction in Spain. So now here we are in, in Spain and it's being reassembled with a team there called Dubuku. So we were able to join up with a local group of engineers and builders that were interested in helping put up this project. And that was key because we only had about 10 hours. And what you're gonna see in the different photos is that there's a lot going on in this site. Again, this symposium, the exhibition there had about 15 to 20 pavilions all on the same site. And there really wasn't a lot of space to, to work. We assembled the shells, each one of them in halves and lifted the two halves into place. So here are a couple of views and again, many hands to lift this up. Here's another view of the shell halves being lifted into place. And here I am connecting the corner of one of the shells to the post. So again, we connected these in halves and the idea was that we would bring these two halves in and they would be able to flex at their corners. So they were basically these pin or hinge connections, and then we would bring the two halves together along the middle seam, and then we would zip them up by making connections. And here you can see Lisa Ramsberg, one of the architects on the project, working to do that part of the installation to finalize going from two halves to a single shell. And here's a final view of the two blue shells, even though they're hot pink shells in the space. You can see that the, the shapes of them are very different and that the, the points of support are different elevations. So again, in the oven, this was key. We were supporting both shells at four different points, but we were using different lengths of string, and that would help influence the shape that the structures would take on. Supporting the shell, the shells, we have these aluminum vertical posts that I had students and our staff in our machine shop fabricate for us. Now, ideally, you would be able to continue the thrust line from the shell so that the um, elements that support the shell were also in pure compression, but we didn't have enough space. So we ended up using these vertical posts and the vertical posts then also have to take bend in. At the base, we have these wood uh, components and these serve both as benches that people can sit on or place a, a T on. And they also help to provide anchorage for the structure. We couldn't connect to the ground. And so these boxes are actually filled with sand to prevent sliding from the thrust force that comes from the shell and also any tendency for the structure to want to overturn. Here's another view of the final pavilion. And again, in the back of all these photographs, you see lots of other interesting structures going, going up. And again, there's a, another symposium with similar specifications coming up in 2021 if anyone is interested. From the inside of the shell, we have a, a change in color again. Here it looks like this deep red. Unfortunately, there wasn't natural light, which is the best way to see the pavilion, but we did have artificial light so that when you kind of went from side to side, you again saw the change in color. Here's a, a photograph back in the oven. And what I really love about this photograph is that it demonstrates the global curvature, the overall shape of the structure, but you also have the local curvature because it's not one monolithic surface, but it's discretized into individual tiles. You find you get these interesting openings between tiles and every tile is kind of doing its own, its own thing. Now this acrylic project investigated both using waste and material transformation. 
And so part of my work is looking at what other kinds of waste and what other kinds of material transformations can we utilize in our work. So another kind of transformation that I've been interested in is looking at clay cracking. So when clay goes from being wet, like at the left side of the photo, to dry on the right side, it cracks. And so often this is a bad thing. Maybe you're working a piece of pottery and that happens, or maybe you come across a dry riverbed and you can see cracks in the bottom. These all have kind of negative connotations, but what if we could use clay cracking as a positive? And so that was the idea, that was the material transformation that a team that I worked on in 2017 put forward for a design competition. So the design competition was called the City of Dreams competition, and it it's done annually. It's for a pavilion in New York City. And the focus is on sustainability and envisioning what it, that means for people living in New York. Now, we envisioned using waste clay as a formwork for casting recycled aluminum cans. Our idea was that we would take clay, we would allow it to crack, we would take aluminum cans, we would melt them, and then we would pour the aluminum into the cracks of the, the clay. These would then produce these panels the panels could then be propagated or utilized in these two portal frame like structures. And then on the site, we would have clay pools that would dry and crack over the course of the summer. Now these clay pools would look like the kind that we use to fabricate the panels. We wouldn't actually cast on site in these clay pools, but they would show people that visited the structure, the way in which we produce the panels. And then with these products involving waste, the hope is always that at the end, the waste can go back to either where it came from or somewhere else in the waste stream. You don't want to just discard the waste and um, have it sit unused. And so here you can see our idea for the wood kind of being recycled and the clay being recycled and the aluminum being transformed into furniture that people can still enjoy. So it was a two-part competition. Here's the rendering that we produced when we got to the finalist stage. You can see we have a nice site here. In the back, you can see One World Trade Center. As part of the, the finalist stage, we studied past competition winners, and we decided that to have a chance of winning, we really should try to produce a prototype. We should provide a proof of concept that we could actually make this radical idea work. And so the weekend before the deadline, one of the team members went out and bought a propane torch and an electric furnace and made this small casting. So you can see a baking sheet filled with clay that is dried and cracked. And then the furnace is shown here. So you would take melted aluminum, pour it into the open mold over here, and then use a propane torch to keep the aluminum flowing. And the result is the prototype shown at the picture at the far right. So I, I then picked that up and had two students work on this for a couple hours to make sure we took off all the sharp, sharp edges. And so we were informed in January of 2017 that we had been fortunate enough to win the competition, but then we had about five months. We needed to meet an early June, June deadline. And at this point, this is the largest piece that we'd cast. So you can again imagine the small baking sheet or the size of this prototype is about the size of a typical computer router. And we had to get up to the size of a two and a half meter panel in five months. So we went on and, and started doing more prototyping. We needed to figure out how to get a reasonable cracking pattern. So we looked at different variables. We looked at different water contents. We looked at how we could fill the trays and we looked at drying techniques. I was fortunate enough to have a student, Saida Manzor, work with me for a full semester, and she investigated many of these different variables. And this is a time-lapse video of a, one of the runs that Saida produced. So here it goes. In this case, she was pressing the clay in, which was really labor-intensive, but we thought we could get good consistency. And here you can see that the clay cracks and really beautiful local clay that we had available to us. The clay crack widths, though, are quite narrow because of the low water content. And in the end, we decided to not use this technique of pressing the clay in because it was labor intensive and produced these kind of narrow cracks. And instead, we moved on to using a higher wa water content clay that acted much like a slurry that we could pour into the forms. And you'll see that. You'll see that soon. We also needed to collect a lot of aluminum to pull this off. So we ran can drives at schools and with other local youth groups. 
we had the help of a, a nonprofit group called Sure We Can. So people in the area were collecting cans that we were then able to access. We got a boost from one of the mun local municipal recycling companies that would that gave us six of these large bales of aluminum that came kind of compressed and we had to pick them apart literally with pickaxes. And then the key thing was you can't use the aluminum in this form, but you actually have to melt it or smelt it down. And so we built a furnace. You can see that in the bottom right with an attempt to melt down this aluminum, but we were in over our heads. We didn't have a lot of time and this is a really energy intensive process. So when you Provide, produce ideas for design competitions like this, right? You're trying to be forward thinking, you're coming up with creative ways to reuse waste, in this case, upcycle waste. But it's also important to think about economy of scale and where in the waste stream you actually want to intercept things to be most efficient. And so here we found that we weren't going to be able to pr produce enough aluminum in this manner in time. So we went ahead and we bought recycled aluminum ingot, which is still much better than, than virgin aluminum ingot. Now we're in March, so we're three months out and we're preparing for a first prototype. At this point, we've been fortunate enough to team with two artists. So we have Scott Thompson on the left and Bruce Lindsay at the right. Each of them have decades of casting experience, which was key because the primary team was architects and engineers that, that didn't. And what you see in this top left photo is a furnace and they're pulling a crucible out and the crucible is filled with molten aluminum. Now in the, the right, what you're gonna see is the actual first pour. So here we go. So they're coming over and I'm I'm filming this and have no experience casting. Again, Scott and Bruce have decades of casting experience and there they go. So they're pouring into the cast. So in this mold, they have clay that is cracked and you can see there's steam coming out and now we sprung a leak and there's some fire and these guys are professionals. They are not flinching at all. They've seen it before. They've taken all the necessary safety precautions. One final little splash of aluminum coming over the top and we had our first prototype. So what you're seeing here with the steam is the moisture that was trapped in the clay. So the clay is being dried and cracking, but you can't really get all the moisture out. So any moisture that's trapped is being released as steam, and that's causing the casting process to be a little bit more volatile than you'd have if you used what's called resin bonded sand. So resin bonded sand is the typical way that this is done to produce components, and there there's, there's no moisture in the mold. So at the bottom left, we're now opening up the mold and you can see the, the remnants of this at the right. So we have at the left in this bottom right photograph, the top component of the mold. We have the aluminum that was cast here, taken out from the clay in the center and then the bottom form at the right. And you're left with not just the really nice example of how to cast into clay in the center, but these really beautiful artifacts, the top and bottom of the mold that show the, the process itself. So this was really key. This prototype allowed us to fully fund a Kickstarter campaign to go on and continue this, this work. So now we're in April, two months out, and we had the, the clay delivered to our site. So we're working at a, at a sculpture park south of New York City. <clears throat> in the top left, we're, we're mixing the slurry. So we've upscaled. We have this large scale mixer. And, and we would take the slurry and we would pour it into these drying trays. And you can see that at the right here, really messy work. The bottom left, we have a couple fans that are on the clay. And what would happen is that as the water evaporated out of the clay, the fans would help push that moist air away. After a couple of days, the clay would go on to crack and you can see those, cla those crack patterns at the bottom right here. Here are the, the steel trays that we upgraded to for the final castings. Unfortunately, we had a low budget for the project, so we could only afford uh, three of these steel trays, but we didn't have enough time to dry only three panels worth of clay at a time. So what we would do is we would dry more panels and then transfer the clay piece by piece like a puzzle. So this ended up being very labor intensive and also partially distorting the clay crack pattern, but we had to work with what we could in the short time frame, but if we were to do this again, the idea would be to dry the clay directly in the steel molds, and that would allow us to be more efficient and also preserve the crack pattern. In the bottom left, you can see one of the trays after it's tied up. So the inside here, we have the clay, and then in the bottom right, we have a casting. So you can see the aluminum is glowing orange here as it's being poured. 
the top left, we are sorry, at the left side, we have the top of the mold. And you can see at the top some of these aluminum splashes. Again, that's happening because the process is a bit volatile and we are getting some of the aluminum kind of burbling up onto the top of the mold. Again, we're um, conducting this in a, in a safe way, but you still do get this, this happening. At the center, you can see one of these panels, again, about two and a half meters long, removed from the mold. The clay is still stuck between the aluminum. And now at the right, you can see three of these panels standing up side by side. So we would first knock the clay out and then use power washers to really get the clay out. And then there's gonna be some sharp edges and as well as what's called flashing. So when you cast, if the aluminum would get underneath the clay, it would fill in the, the opening. And you can see that in the bottom here. Some of the openings aren't fully open. They're, they're partially closed because of this flashing. And so we had to go ahead and remove this flashing and remove the sharp edges through post-processing. So in the top left here, you can see Lisa Ramsberg again, who worked on the two blue shells, was the project leader on this project as well. She's using a plasma cutter to remove the opening. So between Lisa and myself, we spent maybe 20 to 24 hours kind of hunched over these panels, removing the flashing and taking off some of these sharp edges. We had a, an army of volunteers come down and help, and they would also grind off some of the sharp components and get these ready for the site. So here we are at the site. And we had 36 hours to install at this point. We were running right up against the deadline. And we were able to pull it off. We worked right up until opening, but we had a realized structure. And so you'll see that there's a couple of differences from what you saw in the initial final stage rendering. There's only one of the two structures. We ran out of time and money to build a second one. We also had a slight change in site. We're still in New York City. You can still one, see One World Trade Center in the background, but we've just shifted where we're located. The form that was used here, again, is this kind of portal frame, and that was chosen for architectural reasons. And it's not as structurally efficient as the hanging forms that are in pure tension or the inverted forms that are in pure compression. These aluminum panels ended up needing to be supplemented with a, a steel frame, and all the components here are subjected to bending as opposed to the more efficient pure tension or pure compression. And so if you look closely, you can see outlining the aluminum panels are these steel components. Here's another view. You can see here the clay in the foreground has cracked. Also, people would visit the site and you can see some bike tracks going across it. Here's another view of the on-site clay. So throughout the summer, there is rain and that's wetting the clay. And then there's drying and cracking, achieving what we'd hoped would be a way for the visitors to interact with the structure. If you zoom in on the clay, you see that by having the clay outdoors, a number of interesting things happen that we didn't see inside. As the clay would transition from being liquid to plastic or kind of starting to become solid, and it would rain, the rain would be captured in the clay, and you see these little dimples there. We also have leaf imprints and seeds. We found out that there were different the different kinds of wildlife on site. We had birds. We had raccoons and squirrels. People would leave messages and handprints and footprints and became this interactive piece of the structure that we didn't really anticipate. And so that actually became a really special part of the project. In this photograph, we are representing probably the key load case, which is the vandal load, someone that's doing something they're not supposed to be doing. So this is someone from our team on top of the pavilion. And this is all in the service of load testing, making sure it's okay, but also getting this really beautiful photograph and I love this photograph because you can see the cracked clay on the ground juxtaposed with the aluminum panels. And now because of those steel frames, you can see that between adjacent aluminum panels, there's this gap, there's this reveal. And so I think it actually turned out quite nicely that we had the, the steel frame. Now, after the pavilion was taken down, the panels were turned into artwork and furniture. At the left is a photo from an exhibition that we were included in, in in New York City. So um, there were a number of different pieces here. Here that we actually performed a bit of a, we had a bit of a performance in which the panels were tilted down and then plaster of Paris was used to capture the panels negative on the, the floor. And at the right is a stool that's made from cutting down a panel. So we ended up having to make stools, benches, and also selling off full scale panels to fund the project. So these pieces got to live on in people's homes. These experimental projects really involve 
a lot of work and their collaborations among many people. It's, it's not just me. There's um, students, fellow architects and engineers, artists working on these projects. Here you can see a number of my students and in, in total I had 11 students work on this project. In the back here's Saida. She's the one that did a lot of the clay research for me. Um, here's Amanda who came out and helped at the site many times. I had um, Sarah in the front here is a, is a friend. Scott's one of the artists. And then in the back here I am trying to be useful. And here's the design team on opening day. Right? We have fellow engineers, architects, artists, and one of the project sponsors, but also also family too. So here, my my younger daughter was born right around the time we started the the project, and we actually finished building this a year later. At the time, she was just learning how to walk, but she was already really curious. And now that she's four, that curiosity has exploded. It's it's easy to take for granted that our infrastructure has to be built in a in a certain way or with certain materials. But I think if we can remain curious, if we're as open to new and different ideas as kids, then I think we have this opportunity to do and to learn from some really unexpected and some exciting work. So thank you so much for your, your time. I really appreciate having this opportunity to, to talk to you. And again, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm happy to take any questions that you, you might have. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we'll start the question answer session. Um, for this, uh, the participants, you need you can use the raise your hand button, which is at the top, uh, the bottom of your screen. Uh, once you press the button, we would call out your name and you can unmute yourself and ask the question. So uh, let's get to the question session. Uh, anybody with the questions can press the raise your hand button. I think it's still sinking in, so it might take a few seconds, sir. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, um, yes, Manjum? Yes, yes. Edward Stigal. Uh, I just want to have, uh, have you ever tried with any kind of a composite materials like straw and, you know, uh, the the natural materials as a binding and tried out with these kind of experiments with the gum with the load acting over it yeah that's a that's a great question so um personally i i haven't we worked with that mycelium root structure for a little bit the mushroom mushroom material the natural fibers there and one thing i'm i'm interested in kind of returning to is looking at jute fiber again and combining that with some kind of bioresin to create shells. So returning to that project we looked at briefly in 2011, um, yeah, trying to get away from synthetic materials as as much as possible. Yeah. Have you have you had the opportunity to work with some of those materials before? Do you work with um, those kinds of natural fibers? We just work with the uh, you know the fibers like uh, which is reinforced with the con concrete like you know the fiber rainbow reinforced or the FRP kind of fibers. Okay. Worked great. With the Great. How Thank do you, you forecast, uh, you know, the nanomaterials into these kind of forms and everything? So the question is, how do we understand kind of the the, the material properties at the nanoscale and 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 work with them in our projects? Is that the question that you're kind of getting at? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you know, um, I I'm a structural engineer, not a, a material scientist, and we've been primarily working with materials that have properties that we can capture at that scale. So we'll do the testing that we need to do at the the building scale, basically, or at the you can imagine small scale samples that we can put into tension tests or bending tests. So because I haven't been working with composites or looking at developing new materials. We haven't actually been working um, across scales like that or trying to understand the properties at that point. That's super interesting though. I think I think that's actually, there's a lot of a lot of work being done there feeding into how people are using new materials. So that's definitely a part of it. It's it's not the focus of my work, but I think there's um there's a lot of people doing interesting work in that area. So, thank you. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh... Uh, sir, I have a question of my own. In the pre in the starting of the presentation, you were mentioning about the bridge in Morocco, and uh, you had mentioned uh, that the ropes used uh, were polyester. Yes. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned that uh, in the anchoring place, there were two colors involved. There was an orange and there was a blue. 
were they different materials or how did that work? Yeah, no, that that's a great question, Praveen. So um, in that bridge, the the orange ropes were the primary 